Uh, my name is, uh, as I said before, if you are uh, just kind of coming in, I am uh, Tevin Fowler Chapman. I am the Vice President for LA Opera Connects. I wanted to again welcome you to our second annual Arts and Health Week Summit. Uh, to this next panel, uh, first thank you to uh, Kristen Sakoda uh, for the last panel's really wonderful. Uh, this time we're talking about some of our uh, wonderful practitioners, organizations uh, within Los Angeles directly uh, working with people uh, in terms of creative aging, uh, learning about their programs, what they do, what their vision is for uh, the future of this field and how we can have a greater impact. Uh, by addressing some of the challenges that we face as organizations, as practitioners, and also the challenges that are faced by our senior communities. Um, I'm grateful to welcome our four esteemed panelists, uh, each with incredibly unique experiences and viewpoints. We have, I'm gonna go from right to left, we have Mr. John Kander II, uh, the Executive Director for Music Men's Minds. We have Roxy Kirikosian, the Associate Director for Community Education and Alzheimer's LA and a uh, wonderful partner with LA Opera for our Music to Remember program. Thank you for that. Uh, we have also Carol Zoe, who is a creative strategist and artist for the LA County Department of Arts and Culture. So Kirsten had made reference to having uh, resident, or artists and residents working within communities for, public, or for aging and for public health. Carol is one of, those, uh, one of those artists, and we're very happy to have her here. And then we have Dr. Jennifer Wong, who is the director for the Wallace Annenberg Gin Space. Welcome uh, to all of our panelists. One of the first things that I wanted to start with is just really talking about the work that you do, what your organizations or initiatives represent. Uh, and we'll just go from starting with John down to Dr. Wong. Uh, what, uh, you know, whether it's your organization or an initiative that you are a part of, uh, what, what that does in relation to creative aging. And we'll start with you, John, uh, with Music Men's Minds. Hi, it's lovely to be here. Um, and it's a gift to me to be involved with this organization. Our founder, Carol Rosenstein, uh, who's sitting over there in the front, uh, did something amazing. She saw that her husband, who had over a decade of Parkinson's and dementia now that went along with it, only showed sparks of life when she could get him to his piano. So she did what anybody would do who loved her husband. She started a band. <laughs> she called it the Fifth Dementia. The Fifth Dementia has performed on this stage for people in the past, pre-COVID. Uh, she was discovered by the media. It kind of went uh, national. It's now international. We now have eight or nine bands or drum circles in Los Angeles and growing by the day. We're in New Jersey. We're in Washington State. We're about to start in Palo Alto. We're uh, about to start at the VA in, in West LA. And we have uh, relationships with bands and music uh, groups in Rwanda, Bulgaria, the Philippines, India, Canada, and the UK, and Argentina. And the basic fact is this, music is medicine. As Renee was saying earlier, there's a scientific reason why you may not know where you live or who you're married to, but you can still sing somewhere over the rainbow. Now, the anecdotal evidence is perhaps 100% that this is true. What we're about now is trying to prove and find a way to prove the scientific proof so that we can take a group of music groups that deal with 20, 30 people at a time or are online groups, believe it or not, and turn it into public health. And more about that later. Roxy, in addition to having a wonderful partnership with, uh, with LA Opera through Music to Remember, I, you know, Alzheimer's LA is far more expansive uh, beyond the music programs that we do. Could you talk about just the overall the mission of the organization uh, and then how the many arts programs that you guys have uh, you know, kind of encompassed to create a holistic experience for your patients? Yes, thank you very much, and I'd just like to say it's an honor to be here. Thank you so much for everyone who created this wonderful event. I'm happy to be here at the second annual Arts and Health Week Summit. 
Um, I'm from Alzheimer's Los Angeles, and we are a local nonprofit organization, and we serve individuals who are impacted by Alzheimer's disease, related dementias, and cognitive issues and memory loss. And we know what a difficult journey that can be for families, individuals who are going through that journey, and families and communities who are impacted by that. And we do our absolute best to try to support our communities as much as possible. And that is done via our um, art programs, our creative art programs. We've been very lucky and fortunate to partner with LA Opera Connects for the past five years, and we brought a um, wonderful music program to our participants who were impacted by memory loss. And this occurred, this started during the pandemic, and we brought um, our incredibly talented Na uh, Nani, who's here today, so I'd like to give her a shout out. She's an incredibly talented opera singer, and and every month she would prepare a set list of songs and music for our participants to listen to or sing along to and we saw how powerful that can be for individuals who are experiencing memory loss and also for their care partners it creates a meaningful connection um, we see that joy in their eye and it's just wonderful to be able to have some sort of a meaningful activity where both individual uh, who has memory loss and their care partner can both participate in. And we also have our famous Memories in the Making Art program, which we are showcasing here today. And I encourage you all to observe that program that's led by my colleague Annie O. Oh. And it's a painting program, a watercolor painting program that individuals with memory loss and their care partners can both do uh, participate in at the same time. And it's amazing uh, what happens when you hand someone um, a brush and a blank canvas and every stroke and every line has a story to tell and we find that fascinating and we admire uh, the benefits, the positive impact that has on um, the brain's ability to cope with the disease and also uh, the caregiver creating very meaningful connections, um, uh, creating those connections and also maintaining those connections with their loved one. And uh, we're, we're fortunate to have these community partnerships and these collaborations, and we know, recognize the value that provides to our community, and we hope to provide those types of services along with caregiver education, support groups, disease education, health promotion, because at the end of the day, we know that Alzheimer's disease and related dementias are not a normal part of aging. Significant memory loss is not an inevitable consequence of aging, and we know that there are things that we can do to lead healthy lifestyles to reduce our risk of cognitive decline. And one of the most powerful things is that there's many research studies out there that are suggesting that individuals who address risk factors early on and they lead healthy lifestyles, we can delay or prevent 40% of the dementia cases. And that's a pretty powerful statement. And we hope to somehow be part of that by providing these creative aging um, programs to our communities. Thank you so much. And we, uh, we also hope to cover a little bit of the, the whole piece of how you know, the well-being is more beneficial or well-being is benefited in the long run by participation in the arts in the panel in the afternoon. So thank you for speaking, into, speaking to that and segueing into the next panel I'm moderating. Um, for, uh, for Carol, uh, I am so interested to see, or just to hear about how your work as a creative strategist works within the county, uh, within county departments. So we'll pass it to you. Um, yeah, of course. Thank you for having me here. Um, my name is Carol Zhou. I am a creative strategist for the Aging and Disability Services Department in Los Angeles County. And so ADS has 14 centers across Los Angeles County, and specifically for the two years of my residency, I am focused on working with four senior centers in District 1 um, to pilot projects that demonstrate how an artist can interface with the Civic Center and with communities, because when we think about public art, a lot of times we think about 
sculpture or we think about murals, but actually art is so much more than that. And so the projects that I have initiated address the concerns and themes that are present in each of these senior centers. And so I'm currently working with the fourth and final senior center, Centro Maravilla. Um, but as an example of some of the projects that we have initiated in collaboration with the senior centers, for East LA, we focused on the theme of care. Um, these centers are are a site of care, and they really wanted to create an intergenerational community garden. Um, so you saw an image of that in Kristen's talk. Um, for Protrero Heights, um, we focused on the theme of community because this is a hopping senior center. Um, they had Elvis Presley line dances for their winter formal. <laughs> um, and so this was a center that just really demonstrated what it meant to bring your community in as part of the co-creation of your senior center. Um, and for a San Gabriel Valley Service Center, we focused on culture because this center was located in the San Gabriel Valley and served both Chinese-speaking and Spanish-speaking communities. And so we specifically looked at this issue of language access for older communities, um, like Dr. Laura Trejo talked about earlier. And we created a cooking series and a recipe book in order to celebrate these two, a lot of these different distinct cultures and to bring them together. And so these are, I want to say, non-mural ways um, of thinking about the possibilities of arts programming and my hope is that we can create through these pilot projects um, a strategy that can be scaled to the level of the 14 senior centers in Los Angeles County. Thank you so much, Carol. And last but not least, Dr. Wong, who I actually have the pleasure of being, living down the street from the gen space, which is it's nice to drive by and see it all the time. But really, uh, you know, from what I've been able to tell, it's uh, at least from the research, is a holistic approach to aging, um, building community, having programs that are set up to, to bring people together. Could you speak to that a little bit more? Absolutely. Thanks for having me, and fun to go last and hear my incredible colleagues and um, and be with you all today. So thanks for having me. Um, fresh off of the master plan for aging, and prior to the pandemic, um, our leader Wallace Annenberg saw older adults in community, some of which were alone by choice, but some of which weren't were perhaps not alone by choice, kind of in community, a lot of mid midday grocery store runs, a lot of um, sitting alone in theaters, and she thought, um, what's going on? And, and yes, there are a number of wonderful senior centers, but they're not everywhere, and they're not, sometimes they're, they're not easily um, accessed via transportation or, or lack of driving or walking, and so where could she um, kind of contribute to the ongoing resources here in LA. Um, and she found this beautiful building that was being built in Koreatown, one of our most diverse neighborhoods here in Los Angeles, and with direct asset access to a brand new metro station being built right next door to you, um, and uh, a bus station right across the street, and, and uh, a more walkable community for many. Um, and she thought, let's put a space dedicated to older adults there. Um, the Annenberg Foundation, while, while um, a gracious donor um, and uh, has uh, a long investment in arts and culture here in Los Angeles, um, Koreatown was new to us and we would not begin to guess what residents um, in Koreatown and surrounding areas wanted or needed. It's one of the wonderful points that Dr. Trejo and Dr. the previous Dr. Wong had spoken about um, on our panel and so we did a series of focus groups, um, both in English and in language, um, chosen language uh, for residents in and out of Koreatown to see what they wanted and needed in a, in, a, in a community space. Without a doubt, arts and culture were top of the list. So it's one of our pillars here at, or at Wallace Annenberg Gen Space. And um, that means we have things such as dance. Um, yes, there are some line dancing, not to Elvis yet, so might have to add that. Um, Coming soon. But, right? Um, but there's belly dancing, there's salsa dancing, there's wonderful music with Music men, Men's Minds with, with John's colleagues, um, and, and thanks to Carol. Um, we have piano classes um, with um, 
with, uh, with a beautiful piano that was uh, uh, designed and painted by an older adult artist um, and played by residents um, who, and members who are, uh, who are musically far more gifted than I. Um, we have choir and we have pretty much every medium. Yes, there is some sculpture stuff too. Um, and so we like to think that we asked our community they told us that what they wanted and needed, many of which are looking for forms of expression and creativity, but also our older adults, some of them didn't have the rich art and culture education in um, primary school and middle school and high school and even um, opportunities in college that um, those of us from younger generations have the opportunity to have now. So we hear a lot of, I wish I had done this in school. I wish someone had taught me how to paint. I wish I knew I could do this. Um, we have uh, a wonderful member who was um, uh, was in special ed all throughout growing up and she shared with us that she wasn't able to go to art classes like her peers because she was busy catching up on all the work that she needed to catch up on. So these are the things that we love to have our, our members engage in and not only through creativity and self-expression do we find them succeed and, and really soar, but also through the connectivity that is um, creating something, sharing with your, with your friend, sharing with a teacher, learning something new, um, and, uh, and really seeing what you're capable of. So we like to think of that. I love that. Thank you so much, uh, all of you. Uh, you know, in thinking about this, uh, and thinking about the subject, really trying to identify uh, what are some core, or what are some very common uh, issues that our senior populations are dealing with. Uh, what I continue to see across the board were, you know, it was five sections that I have kind of looped into three, one of which is obviously that there's the physical and uh, mental emotional, the, the deterioration and the slowing down of our bodies and minds. Uh, you know, also a big one for us, uh, which is a huge factor, which has proven to be a huge factor, is the financial security for our senior populations. And the, you know, that coupled with the rising costs in healthcare, uh, the rising costs and expenses. And then, you know, the last piece, which we've, we've spoken to already very beautifully, which is the, how we can address the isolation for seniors, how we can help, how we can use the arts as a, uh, as a way to bring to bring people together, create communities through the arts, uh, and I wanted to actually go back to to you, Dr. Wong, which was, uh, you know, it seems as though in terms of the the just the physical aging piece, the mental aging piece, uh, it's you're really working to help not just but you're really working to help inspire people to move to actually engage their bodies, engage their minds in ways that they might not have over years if they did not have access. And I'm wondering if you see, uh, if you see the, how you see the benefits coming out in terms of those programs inspiring people to, to, uh, to use their bodies and minds in ways that they haven't. Sure. Um, one of the things that was spoken about um, on the previous uh, panel was the idea that, you know, even our mental and physical health, what it looks like um, coming out of the pandemic. Um, and at, well, working at, at the state, we talked about how older adults were the first ones to stay at home and pretty much last ones to leave their home. Um, and so we see not only in the normal aging process, which is sometimes a, a slowdown of both, um, both due to cognition or mobility or, um, or as a result of social isolation, um, including depression and anxiety, but the pandemic really exasperated all of those things in, in many of our older adults and community. Um, and so creating a space where they felt safe and they felt like they could um, safely come back into community, whether they were still wearing masks or, you know, were, were created um, a space where they knew that the folks around them were on the same page about um, vaccinations and other things, all of that created a space where they could gather and, and really by having an array of classes that 
um, hopefully some of them would engage in. If, if dancing's not your thing, maybe knitting is. If knitting's not your thing, maybe this cool workshop on, um, on, on ink processing with LACMA is the way to go, right? There were all of these different options that we hoped that our members would engage at least, it would almost like a gateway, right? You go to one and then maybe you'll go to another. And through that, both fine motor skills, um, core strength, if you're standing and ink printing, um, you know, the ability to continue lifelong learning with um, learning about different processes and different artists and different um, ways to, to do brush strokes, all of that matters. And we think that for older adults who were more hesitant about all of those things by giving them choice, they could find something that really resonated with them. And I would also just add that I know the other pieces of this is financial security and safety and all of these things. Um, we are very, very blessed to have support from Wallace Annenberg um, and some really, really, really great partners. Um, partners that, um, that are both um, in, in, in GenSpace all the time and ones that come for special workshops. And so I think it, when thinking about arts um, and how we bring those to older adults, we do a, a really great job to bringing them to, to younger, um, to our younger peers in community. And we are seeing a really great um, uptick in what those partnerships look like in older adult spaces. My colleague to the right of me is a really great example of how we continue to bring art and culture to senior centers, nursing homes, residential facilities, senior affordable housing, all of these other spaces. And I think to continue that work um, is to ask our, our older adults what they want and need and to really be inspired by what they're able to create and show that back in the world just like we get to see today. Thank you so much. Uh, Roxy, it's a very similar question, which is, you know, in, in addition to our Music to Remember program, which is really helping, um, you know, really helping people unlock, you know, memories through music or, you know, unlocking themselves through music. Do you have a wide range of programs related to the arts, uh, whether it is visual arts, performing arts? How do you see um, the impacts on the, the physical, mental, emotional capabilities through, you know, through our program, but also through the suite of programs that you guys offer for your, uh, for your clients? That's a great question. And one of the pillars of brain health is socialization. And with socialization, we know that it's important at every stage of life, but it can be especially life-affirming later on in life. And we know how significant it is to lead a very socially active, meaningful, meaningfully active lifestyle. And when you combine the socialization with the creative arts, we see the positive impact that it has on the brain, on the overall health and quality of life. And many of the leaders that have spoken today, it truly does have healing powers. And I appreciate um, Renee Fleming talking about the correlation between art and music and uh, the brain plasticity. And we see that. Um, we see that individuals who have a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease or a related dementia, when they have a very meaningful activity to participate in, and it's, um, it's a socially active program where they get to connect with others who have the same experience they have, and they get to be in a room where they're very happy and content and very involved in the activity. activity. We see that it um, develops the part of the brain that um, increases the ability to cope with the disease. And it creates also in individuals who do not have Alzheimer's disease or the worried well, right? Everyone who has a brain is at risk of Alzheimer's disease, unfortunately. And individuals who do not have Alzheimer's or cognitive impairment, everyone is concerned and they want to know what can I do to reduce my risk of cognitive decline? And we understand and appreciate and value creative arts programs like music and art and how that can be beneficial for the overall brain and how specifically that creates cognitive reserve early on in life. And cognitive reserve is basically like um, neural redundancy. 
It's the brain's ability to bounce back when it experiences hardship. And firsthand, we get to see individuals with Alzheimer's, related dementias, cognitive decline, um, light up when they're very engaged in the activity. And we see a shift in perspective along with the caregivers as well. Um, it's a new way of connecting, a new way of communicating with their loved one because we know communication can be very difficult for people who have Alzheimer's and related dementias. They don't have the ability to express language. And so um, programs like Memories in the Making or the Music to Remember with LA Opera, those key collaborations that we have, those types of programs, it creates those meaningful connections and it allows people with Alzheimer's or related dementias a way of expressing themselves. It's a way of self-expression and it's a way for them to communicate and to connect with their loved one. Thank you so much. Carol, uh, one of the things I was um, also curious for you with is your, a lot of this is you're developing a lot within communities, which is no easy feat uh, by any, by any uh, stretch of the imagination. When you're developing uh, you know, these partnerships within senior homes, uh, how are you taking the, I guess, the, the physical needs, the mental needs into account when thinking of programs and uh, things that can actually help people? Um, yeah, thank you for that. Um, so as an artist, my background is in doing durational projects. And so as an example, I've been in residence at an affordable housing corporation for four years um, as another one of my projects. And I do think that it takes time to build relationships and to understand the infrastructure of an organization. Um, I have a mentor who once told me that she spent one year having 500 coffees with people um, just to understand a community. And so I think about that a lot. And with the way that my current residency is structured, I spend three months with each senior center. And as you can imagine, I do not have time to have 500 coffees in those <laughs> three months. And so I am actually incredibly reliant on the staff as interface. And what I have learned actually is that the staff are treasures and MVPs of these particular senior centers. They do so much. So as an artist, I focus on the arts programming, but these are holistic centers that provide utilities assistance, that provide toy loan programs, um, that provide food security assistance, and so the staff handle all of that. Um, the staff are also personal connectors to the senior community. Um, so for San Gabriel Valley, I'd worked with a Mandarin-speaking staff member who was very rare, um, you know, when it came to all the senior centers that we worked with, and she actually had seniors follow her from center to center because she provided the language access that they needed. And so for me, it is so important to listen to community members and to listen to staff who have been with community members for several years because they are often best able to articulate community needs. Thank you, and I just, I mean, I want to commend all of you because it's, I mean, it's one piece also to be working within the arts, but to consider all of the holistic needs of, uh, of the people that we are working with uh, in, the, in treatment and therapy and, uh, and just overall well-being. It's just very inspiring for me. Uh, one of the next things that I wanted to talk about, which was just the financial security, and it's not just on the side of... Um, not just on the side of the people who are in need of care, who are in need of programs, but also balancing that with the needs of organizations. We want to make sure that uh, we want to make sure that people have access, uh, that finances are not a barrier, uh, especially as you are, you know, your chance, your opportunities for employment become uh, less in some cases. Uh, and we also want to be able to balance that with sustainability. John, I know that you and I had a wonderful conversation about this earlier, but how are you um, approaching the standpoint of making accessible uh, programs from a financial barrier perspective and also trying to, or, you know, and also ensuring the sustainability of the organization? Uh, difficult question, but a good question. Uh, first I of try. all, <laughs> First of all, uh, Music Men's Minds music groups are free, period, the end. 
uh, nobody is charged for it. We have had volunteers as our music directors, and uh, we have certified music therapists who we pay because we ought to pay them. That's their job, that's their avocation. If they're not out there and earning money and having careers, then we're not, we're not gonna be able to do uh, what we wanna do, and they're not gonna be to do. Let's take the extension of the, uh, the, the music argument for health uh, just quickly to its final extension. Um, this is also preventative. I mean, there are six, over six million Alzheimer's patients in the United States now. There's, every three seconds or so, there's a new dementia diagnosis. Uh, baby boomers are the biggest uh, cohort uh, of Americans and people in the world, and we're getting to the age where we're, we're gonna have a lot of infirmities. So we can probably expect that 40 million of us are gonna get hit by this in one way or another. And if it's not you, it's somebody in your family or you're going to be a caregiver uh, for it. So music is important. It's preventative to help people build the tools to have resources to rely on to make them happy uh, when other things are not so easy. Uh, the end of this argument is why on earth don't we treat music in schools as more important because we're helping people build the muscles to be able to do it. Uh, I know it's an argument for another day. So we as an organization, get back to your uh, uh, initial question, is why we provide it free, we are spreading out as much as we can with, uh, first of all, Los Angeles County. Thank you very much, Laura. Uh, where we are going to into senior centers that are there that already bus people in, they provide transportation in a lot of cases, they bring them there, they even feed them. And imagine having a, an hour of a music engagement either right before lunch or right after lunch. That's what we're doing, that's what we have uh, at GenSpace. I, if you've never seen a drum circle, you owe it to yourself to do it. Every culture in the world has a rhythm part of, 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 of their history and, and of their culture. And when you blend it together and you see a back and forth, a call and effect of people going back and forth, you're seeing communication, even communication between people who cannot speak. There's a man at Gen Space who was so excited he brought his 101-year-old mother uh, there. Or I'm not sure, maybe she's the one that brought him, I'm not sure. Um, it is amazing. And some of you may not look at that and say, well, that's not music. Well, it sure is uh, music and it's communication, and it's a chance for people to express themselves and perform. We have Parkinson's patients who cannot get a word out that you can understand trying to do solos for us. We have one gentleman who speaks through his computer, but he's singing every week. And we have a, uh, an interesting uh, piece of tape on our website where a music therapist is working with him and getting him to get into a rhythm section and then explain what he had for breakfast. And lo and behold, in one minute, you know exactly what happened and you know, and, and he knows that he just spoke to you. The people who sing with us know that they did, whether they sing a solo or not. We just had our jazz band called the Jazz Novas in Studio City, had a, had a concert. We perform there at a church. We perform at a church in Brentwood. We perform uh, I think there's probably another church involved, I can't remember uh, right now. All, they give us the space, um, we pay for the technical uh, facilities that we need for amplification and for the microphones and for sometimes the instruments. And um, we had a gentleman who performed at our uh, uh, jazz concert who had to be helped, it took him about a minute and a half to get up to the stage from the front row and to sit down and then played the hell out of Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Shocked everybody. At our drum circles, the, the caregivers who are there know they have to be alert because people who never get out of the wheelchairs will get up and try and start dancing. Um, to know that they can do it, to know that they can express themselves is an unbelievable gift that we give to these people. Now, if we can do it on a macro scale, all of these uh, senior centers, and for a lot more, um, 
all of a sudden you're affecting the public health of your community. And I hope I'll get, be able to get to, uh, to that later. But right now, we are completely free and we're working with the people who believe that it should be free. Absolutely, thank you. And you had touched on something as well that I wanted to, Carol had brought this up before and I'm totally in lockstep agreement with her, which is, you know, it's also the piece of making sure that we are honoring uh, the work and dedication of our artists and compensating them accordingly. And I'm wondering, Carol, if you can speak to that. Just yeah, as an artist, I'm always wondering about how to pay my bills. <laughs> and I imagine. will say thank you to um, Los Angeles County Department of Arts and Culture for providing me with a living wage um, and with a project budget for these two years. Um, and so I think as an artist, I know how to work with what I have, right? But I'm trying to change my mindset to, well, what is it that I deserve? Um, and I think about that not only for artists, but also for our seniors as well. Um, so I am from China. My mom is not yet retired in the States, but her younger sisters are retired in China. And so that just reminds me that we choose what is important to us and that we actually have other social models from other places when it comes to investment in artists and investment in seniors. And so I think there is a level of making do with what we have, but I also hope that we come away really thinking that artists and seniors deserve the world. 